right, we're back. Hopefully it doesn't have those horrible sound problems like last time, but we'll see. Um, so now we're switching the iPads and phones and we're out of space. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna, we only have like 10 more minutes left, so we're less. So um, guild organization, right, we just said that somebody who works in a guild, they finally get the position as a uh, journeyman, and that's if they work their whole life, they become a master. The guilds were really important in the Middle Ages because not only were they training opportunities for workers, but they also um, played a role in, in government and running the towns because towns didn't have lords like those manors did. So who was going to be in charge of, of running things? Who was going to be in charge of organizing? Well, you already have a guild that's very organized, that's very established, that's got a lot of people working in it. Very often they were the ones who had a lot, of, a big role in running the towns. Um, merchant guilds or craft guilds. More merchant guilds. Than that. Oh, here we go. Merchant guilds ran towns. Look at that. Um, and they protected the rights of workers or at least the opportunity for them make sure that people weren't undercutting them on prices and things like that. Um, government, labor, military obligation. You know, I feel like we've talked about this enough. Do you guys think we don't talk about, about military obligation? We talked about conscription previously. We talked about corvée labor. You can write down conscription. Do conscription for government labor. You can write write down uh, do corvée labor. Um, people working for governments, the increase of, of uh, access to I mean, in the Tang Dynasty and the Song Dynasty, you have more people working for That's uh, that's corvée labor. We talked about that already. Um, here we go. Government labor. Medieval taxes were paid to the ruling class to be paid via labor owed to the state. Corvée labor. Uh, military obligation. The church and peasants owe their military service to the Lord. Um, well, I don't know if I totally love that because it's really the knights that have to do it. Sometimes peasants would be conscripted into the military, um, but primarily it's the it's the knights that did it. Until later on in the Middle Ages, when you start to have kings establishing. Um, standing armies. We talked last time, I think, about the importance of a, a standing army. Right? So we don't need to go over that again. Um, there you go. It's in the, there. If you want to go back on any of that, you need clarification. Um, areas where women exercise more power and influence. Yeah. All right. So, um, Mongol. So the Mongols, uh, I don't know how much I, I don't know how much I love the, some of the quotes in here, to be honest with you, um, but it's at least good for the images. Mongols, one thing to keep in mind is that the Mongols are a pastoral nomadic civilization, right? Even though they're conquering, you know, big sedentary agricultural civilizations and they're adapting to them in many ways, they still bring that pastoral nomadic style to the way that they rule and the way to things that they value, um, the way they organize themselves. And one thing to keep in mind about pastoral nomadic cultures is because they're not sedentary agricultural cultures, they don't, don't have, have as many of those kind of like original sins, um, if we use over, make an overly religious terminology, uh, that settled agriculture has, right? What are the two... I never even used this term before, but I feel like I might start doing it. What are the two original sins of, of uh, agriculture? Settled agriculture. What are the two big problems that emerge from... No, 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 like... like Things. Uh, that, that one's pretty bad too. But like as a society, what are the prop the problems of society? Inequality. What are the two inequalities? So what is that called? What kind of inequality? What kind of inequalities do we have because of the development of sedentary agriculture at least? So I mean patriarchy, right? Right? Gender inequality and social inequality, right? Social strategy. Right, that's m that's a much bigger problem in agricultural sedentary societies, especially the bigger the civilization gets, the more pronounced that problem is. But for people who are nomadic pastoralists, they don't have as many of those reasons that cause that. Therefore, they don't have those issues as much. And it's not really as much a part of their culture. So when they conquer places, they bring that feeling in, and particularly with women, it's less patriarchal in Mongol society. Um, women were, you know played a role in the society, they were, uh, you know, pretty tough, um, and they, women were often advisors to the great khans, right, um, so they, they were more open to women, and uh, they mentioned, like, ideas about, uh, in, in, in the East, in 
kind of the finding was, was dampened because of the Mongols. Um, covering in terms of, the, they use the word burqa. I don't know how accurate that is because I feel like that word is often misapplied or overapplied. Um, perhaps bur burqa literally is like the full, like full, full covering that you see in um, some places, some parts of Afghanistan. Now, it, well, during, uh, under certain periods, you saw that. Um, a more a more excessive form of covering than is than is advocated in actual Islamic teaching, right? We talked about I think we talked about last time we compared Persia and West Africa. Where we said that in West Africa the, 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 the rules were, were kind of loosened yeah. and in the Persian and or Persian influence areas they were tightened in terms of women and, and particularly clothing, right? Because Islamic teaching said cover your hair, you know, cover your chest, you know. Um, but but then in Persia they had a history of full covering like full veiling right, um, which was not something that was necessarily practiced in, in early Islamic days. In West Africa they were much more uh, open. What's the right word, huh? Open. Open. Yeah, that's, that's a good that's a good English word. Right. Mm -hmm. Open with clothing um, for women, and so those pre pre existing cultures influence Islam. And now same thing as the Mongols come in, they will have an influence on those Persian cultures by taking them back in a different direction of, of, where, of having less covering um, and less foot binding in China. Um, in West Africa, here we go again, this is the one we talked about last time, so we don't need to say too much about it, right? But we were very surprised to see, um, not only, last time we talked about it in terms of clothing, but we don't want to harp on clothing too much, uh, we have that problem already, um, is that women played a, an important role in West African society. Um, the clothing is just one element of it, but in general they were more, a more open society in terms of gender, but again, how much of that is influenced by civilization, right? And, and uh, how complex their governments were. Uh, at this time, Mali, Ghana, you know, they're, they, they're developing these really massive kingdoms, right? Because of the massive wealth that they have. But two things there. One, that hadn't existed from way, way back, like it had in Mesopotamia and Egypt, things like that. So it, it wasn't there as long to create more patriarchy. So they're a little bit closer to the the more uh, gender egalitarian systems that existed before the development of these big um, sedentary agricultural civilizations. And uh, I don't know how much of a factor this is just off the top of my head, but the fact that, that it's based on the, this um, wealth and gold that's produced within the society, you know, because they can rely on that more than they have to rely on the, the labor of their people and, and all of the regular social stratification that we see in job specialization, and that would leave, that would make patriarchy less necessary. Necessary is the wrong word, because it's never necessary, but it wouldn't put less pressure toward to go toward patriarchy, right? Um, so it would help to retain that more, more gender equality, more gender egalitarian. Um, Japan, um, little Sakashikibu, man. You guys remember her? Nope. More Sakashikibu, I never told you the story about my friend Steve, who would go into my my uh, dictionary app on my computer when I was in like middle school. He would find words that he that he wanted to make the thing repeat. Do you remember that? Sounds like Sashiki. Make it say, Morisaki Shikibu, Morisaki Shikibu. And I never knew what that, who that was, but I always remember that name. And then when I learned about it, I was like, oh my gosh, Morisaki Shikibu. Steve, shout out to Steve if you're out there watching. Um, I'm like, just had this preview of looking through her buddy Steve. And they make me like, oh my gosh, you're like, oh, shit. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, Morisaki Shikibu, because in, within in Japan, during the Tang Dynasty, there, uh, there was a lot of Chinese influence on Japan. And even after the Tang Dynasty, uh, during the Heian period in Japan, they, they still maintained Chinese culture, Chinese language, and men were the only ones who were allowed to, to uh, learn Chinese. Um, it's supposed to be something sophisticated and superior. So women, you're not allowed to do that. You have to speak our own <laughs> Japanese language. But the irony is that the great Japanese literature of this period is only written by women. Because the men were all speaking and writing. They were all speaking and writing in Chinese. Looks back for its own writing, they go, Well, it's nothing here, it's all Chinese. What do we want this for? We want Japanese. We gotta read the women. And so, you have the first the author of the first uh, um, first novel, modern modern concept of a novel that's ever been written, The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu. You can see my post on Instagram from Our Women's History Month, one of the four women that I highlighted uh, was Murasaki Shikibu. Um, and some women even became samurai in Southeast Asia. Um, women have traditionally had more freedoms because the work was agricultural. So when you when we have more job specialization, a lot of those specialized jobs go to men, right? But many women can both obviously well, men and women can both do anything um, except have babies and breastfeed. That's exclusively for women. 
but uh, for now. <laughs> but <laughs> no. I don't know. You never know what science will come up with. Green revolution. We have all these new things, so who knows? Um, <laughs> I'm sure my wife would think that she would say, You can have the next one. I mean, you can switch on and off. Yes. Yeah, well, I'll have Bob a whole bunch of things. As long as you want to, as long as you'll give birth to have them. Um, so, how do we get on that? It, it, took, it only took 20 seconds to devolve into eternity. Um, but because the work was, because the work is primarily agricultural, right? Um, <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> there was no financial burden due to bride price. Men and women moved in with their wives' families um, because men and women both have access to the same type of wealth. Um, we haven't talked too much about bride price dowries. Did that, did that come up? I don't know. I'm surprised it didn't. I guess it's not uh, highlighted as much. But um, you only have so much time. Um, we talked about. I think every single one of these things. So uh, we talked about European serfdom. We can mention the Japanese serfdom, yeah. just like the Duke of Yeah, we mentioned. Yeah, we just. I mean, we said it's basically, basically not that different from Jap uh, European feudalism. Excuse me, a Japanese feudalism. Um, a lot, a lot of similarities there. Same kind of, same kind of idea. And really, there's serfdom and I mean, and, and things along those lines in, in China. Um, maybe not. Feudal type structures, you know, throughout the world. Under these kind of situations, where where you have uh, decentralized systems and uh, less central government, we talked about Mita system. So I said we'll, we'll cut through these. Um, this was one that somebody asked me about in the review on, on, the, on Sunday, and so I wanted to throw this up for you guys. Um, two peasant revolts. Um, I think we talked about this one. We did not talk about uh, Basil the Copperhand. Um, so Red Turban Revolt, which is the one that uh, brought an end to the um, the Wan Dynasty. Um, so we talk about how I think we talked about this already, but the Wan Dynasty was um, under Kublai Khan was doing pretty well, lots of cultural infusion, lots of development. But after he died, there was you know the corruption and, and we know oh, that, that old cycle over there. That's the cycle, right? The mandate of heaven. Uh, that Chinese that Chinese belief that if if the government is doing something bad, then heaven, right, um, will respond with natural disasters, floods. Here's another picture from. Uh, like the cloudy sky, and then yeah. So, so we had the the Sha, the Zhou Dynasty, and the the, Shi, the Sha Dynasty, the Shang Dynasty, and the Zhou Dynasty for that activity. But you know, this is still something that people that people cling to and people believe in. So, when the Wan Dynasty wasn't behaving well, um, the the Red Turban Revolt rose up um, and tried to <coughs> and tried to uh, overthrow them, and ultimately they were successful. Um, and uh, China, China is pretty interesting that you tend to. You're more than once you have peasant rebels that are leading rebellions become rulers of China. Um, we, I, if I'm not mistaken, the Tang Dynasty, I think. Mm, don't don't at me. Right. Um, but I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that was a situation where one of the rebels actually became the leader, and then and then I mean, connected to the period six. I mean Mao, right? Mao no, Zedong, right? Was was, was part of one of these rebels, and, and he rose up to be a ruler of China. Um, it doesn't. It's not something that we see happen a lot in most of the world. Usually rebellions, peasants or other people might lead them, but usually they collapse and get into too much conflict and some powerful lord or some other person takes power. But China has a has a record where common people have a seem to have a few a few wins uh, in, in gaining power. Um, Basil the Copperhead, this is the Byzantine Empire, 932. So um, so these are peasant revolts. Um, one thing we should keep in mind is that most revolutions or revolts uh, don't end empires but they weaken them, right? And then, then there's the government is not strong enough to maintain power, and, you, and it ends up splintering. Um, we see that in China, we see that in Europe, uh, we see that you know, in the end of the classical period, and also during the post-classical period. Um, so, in, so you had revolts of peasants, um, you know, that, that we just talked about, the idea of that socio-economic inequality, um, and that leads to uh, peasant revolts. Um, Basil had his tank cut off for impersonating a dead general. That's pretty memorable. Um, and he had to replace with a copper one, hence the name. Uh, he then led a group of angry free peasants from Bithynia, um, in modern day Turkey, you know, not what Turkey then. Um, and they were refusing to pay the high taxes and the business expense of the army, ended the rebellion, and burned Basil alive. Um, well, 
do, right? Um, I think... Is that the end here? Oh, last one is uh, just how new religion is adopted and affected gender relations and family structure. Um, is this the right one? Oops, I don't go too far. So, I mean, there's, it's pretty small. We don't have too much to say here. Um, Islam, you know, they're, depending on where it's going, we're, we're having different impacts on, in terms of gender. Um, I guess just because you brought it up a minute ago, I'll just mention this one example, which I think is kind of random but interesting. Because um, things like dowry and bride price are interesting for the AP. And since I have, can't think of anything else that we haven't already said, I'll just say this here for Islam. Um, uh, this is actually in your, one of the AP questions you guys did last year on your test. Just as a reference, um, we talk, there was that question about divorce, right? And a female initiated divorce. It's very kind of ar uh, uh, obscure, but we actually came up and you, you guys who weren't here in the past watched re the review session. And did, we did talk about that concept um, that Islam, and we talked about it in class actually because we had a review question and he had a group question that Islam gave uh, women the right to divorce, although it was a different different type of divorce than the way it was um, the way it was carried out from the men. From The world, women did not necessarily have the right to divorce or had the freedom in their culture to divorce, um, were harshly stigmatized. Um, so that's a pretty big advance for women. But another thing that I think is interesting, and even though it's a small one, is this issue of dowry. And I think very often in, 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 in that in that um, in that quote, they, they use the word dowry, and it's actually a misnomer. So there's there's dowry and there's bride price, right? Dowry is something. This is not something within Islam, but just in cultures in general. Um, bride price is where the Groom pays the bride's family for the bride, right? So if the guy wants to get married, hey, you want to marry my daughter? It's like a purchase, right? Um, I'm gonna, you have to give me, the father, money, right? In order for me to give you, give up my daughter to you, right? Uh, almost like I have a commodity you want, and I'm going to charge you for it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Not if it makes sense. It's just Sorry, but you understand yeah. what it means. Uh, that's, that's called bride price. The father or the, the family of the bride pays the groom money to take the daughter off their hands. So here's my financial burden, and now I'm placing this woman, which we see as nothing more than a financial burden, on you. So here's some startup money, so you know you don't go broke taking care of this total financial burden. Call the woman, right? I'm not saying this. This is what society has said is part of patriarchy, right? So that's dowry, right? So the guy would get money. When, in which one of those situations does the girl get money? None, right? So in Islam, there's something called the mahr, M-A-H-R, which is similar to, it's closer to bride price than it is to dowry, but very often people say, oh, that's like a dowry. It's not a dowry, because who gets the money? The woman. So the, in order to get married, the man has to give not the wife's family, but the woman herself some gift of money, and you know who decides how much it is? Yeah. yeah. So she says, I want this, otherwise it's not happening. Can you get me, a, buy me a Bugatti? That's, that's, that's my price, you know? So it's like bride price, but it's an adapted one that gives the women more more power. And the idea is that she has money now that that becomes her her um, like a nest egg, right? If you're in a, if you have a problem, if you need money to, to, to lean on, you know she has access to that money. And in a, in a time when women often were you know more in the home, they didn't have access to uh, to you know their own wealth. They had their family's wealth, their their, part, their father's wealth, their husband's wealth that gave them more um, financial freedom. Um, and we know that uh, also they had the right to work, and, and you, you mentioned Khadijah, who was the, the Prophet's first wife. Um, before she died during his lifetime, she was she was his boss. In addition to being a working woman, she was a, a merchant, and she had people working for her. He was one of the merchants who worked for her. So there's, uh, you know, there's, we, we wouldn't go so far as to say that Islam is uh, anti-patriarchal. There's, certain, there's certainly um, patriarchal elements that Islam upholds. Um, and gender roles and, and certain responsibilities that men and women have. Um, but there's a lot of big and uh, female infanticide, right? Killing children. We talked about this with Christianity as well. That in the Roman world, in the pre Islamic Arabian world, they used to kill baby daughters if they were um, uh, they were unwanted because, they, we said, they were seen as a financial burden. A boy was something to be proud of, and unfortunately, as disgusting as it is, a girl was seen as something disgraceful or wasteful, and so they would actually kill their daughters. And this is something we still see in the world today. Um, we, it, we've seen it, India is maybe the worst offender of this, um, and China as well, especially under the one-child policy. People said, I'm going to have one, make it a boy. Um, and now it's done through abortion rather than through actually killing the baby. 
Um, but that mentality still does exist, unfortunately. The patriarchy is uh, alive and well. Um, female, mona female mona monastic orders in Christian and Buddhism, this is done, right? We have this idea that women can be uh, devote their lives to the church. And I know it seems weird to say, and if you, it's kind of a low bar in terms of, uh, of um, opportunities for women, but if you become a nun, right, you now have a, a, a new independent life where you don't have men telling you what to do. So sorry you have to like become celibate and like live in a monastery for the rest of your life in order to get that. So like I said, low bar. Um, but in a, in a society where either your father or your husband is constantly controlling you and telling you what to do, having the opportunity to become a nun and move to a monastery where you're with other women mm -hmm. and women are in charge. You where else are you going to see a hierarchy, you know, where the authority figure is a woman? In medieval Europe, right? It's not, you're not gonna, it's not gonna happen. So within within those convents, right, um, in these female monastic orders, that provides an opportunity for women in a role of uh, a prominent role, an important role, uh, an honored role, a respected role in society. Um, I think I think we can kind of end there, yeah. 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 Um, uh, Neo Confucian. Uh, a woman ruler is a hen crowing. I like that one. You get it? Yeah. Like hens don't crow, what crows? A rooster, right? So saying it's, it's unnatural for a woman to be a ruler. That's what they're saying. Women's greatest duty is to produce a son. Women are to be led and to follow others. So that was what Neo Confucianism was like. So different, uh, different ideas about, uh, about gender there. Um, all right. Oh, I think we're tapped out, guys. Let's call it a day.